Hello again for another week of world history. Today is ancient Greece. And it's kind of a longer lesson, but I'm going to make it as short and to the point I can for you. So let's see how this goes. It's about 20 slides. Now, the earliest Greek peoples, uh, we have to look at a group of people called the Minoans and a group of people called the Mycenaeans. Uh, the, the Minoans are going to live on the island of Crete, which is just off the southern coast of modern day Greece. And they were named after the mythical king Minos. We don't know for sure if Minos existed or not, but that's the name that we've given to the people. Uh, somewhere around 1650 BC, the island of Crete's home to the Minoan culture. The Minoan culture is, is flourishing, and almost all we know about them comes from their archaeology. We can't read, we cannot decipher their written language. The symbol of Minoan culture seems to be the palace. There were a number of palaces that dotted the island of Crete. It looks like the most important one was at the city of Knossos. And it looks like these palaces were the political and economic center of Minoan society. Uh, there we found storage areas, we found evidence of trading centers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we found Minoan influence or evidence all throughout the Mediterranean Sea. That tells us that they traded a lot with their neighbors. Now, for whatever reason, uh, somewhere around 1650 BC, they start to disappear. Now, their neighbors to the north are the Mycenaeans. They live on mainland Greece on the southern coast. Uh, they're very similar to the Minoans. There is trading throughout the Mediterranean. Their kings rule from palaces. These palaces are economic and political centers. The biggest difference is, though, the Mycenaeans have walls around their cities. Now the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, they know each other. And for a while they were friends, but eventually they're going to attack each other. Uh, the Mycenaeans are going to attack the island of Crete around 1450 BC. The Mycenaeans destroy a lot of the Minoan palaces. They capture the one at Knossos, and the Mycenaeans are going to rule over Crete for a couple of years, but then eventually through what we believe was an internal civil war, the Mycenaeans are going to destroy themselves as well. That leads us to what we call the Dark Age of Greece. This is a 300 year or so period where Greek civilization kind of undergoes this change, uh, roughly 1100 to 300 B. I'm sorry, roughly 1100 to 800 BC, uh, 300 year period. Uh, this is a period of poverty, of disruption. The Myce Mycenaeans, the Minoans, uh, they've disappeared. Literacy is gone. It's a period of chaos, if you will. The Phoenician language, which is a language you know today, because our alphabet is based off the Phoenician alphabet. Uh, it's adopted and used. Uh, the original alphabet of the Mycenaeans and Minoans is replaced. We also get what we call the Homeric age. Uh, the poet Homer, which was most likely multiple people, uh, they developed this oral tradition. Uh, the most famous stories from the day are the Iliad and the Odyssey. And those poems, those stories are told from generation to generation, passed down until eventually they were written. The Dark Age of Greece also sees the development of something called the polis or city-state. Uh, you might have heard of Indianapolis or Annapolis, something like that. Uh, that this is where those places get their name. Uh, the polis <clears throat> or city-state isn't just the city. Uh, whenever I describe a city-state, I try and tell people to think more of like our modern county. You've got the main uh, society, the main city, if you will. But then you may also have other little towns, other little villages within the county. 
it's going to be a compact group of people with similar cultures, similar laws. <clears throat> uh, most of these city-states have something called an acropolis at the, at the center, which is a hill that could be defended in times of warfare. And the acropolis is also going to be where the, the warship buildings are kept because they're going to be easily defended. The agora is going to surround the acropolis. And the agora is going to be an open meeting space where all the public buildings are. And it's also going to be where the theaters are held, etc., etc. And you may have heard the word agoraphobia. That comes from the word agora. <clears throat> if you have agoraphobia, you're afraid of wide open spaces or being outside. The area around the polis, the area around the city is known as the cora. And the cora includes farmland where the crops are grown pasture land where the goats are kept, and then wasteland, which is usually where the rock quarries and the minerals are gotten from. Now these city-states, or the polis, it's not that friendly to outsiders. Because this is such a tight-knit, compact group, and because the laws of that polis reflect that group of people, it's not very open to outsiders. It would be like if Carroll County and Douglas County have completely different rules or if Harrelson County and, I don't know, Troop County had completely different rules uh, or different laws, different culture. Even though they're small and they're close together, it's not very welcoming. Um, a, more, a more easily understood situation. If you've ever been the new kid at a school, you feel a little bit out of place and strange at first, and you may not be accepted at first. It's kind of like that. If you move from a city state to a city state, you're the new kid on the block, so to speak, and people might be a little wary of you. Now, governing the polis, there are a couple different governments that were used. Uh, one type of government used is the monarchy, where there is a king. Uh, in an aristocracy, usually the wealthy, a, a good number of wealthy people are going to rule. In an oligarchy, that's the rule of the few, there's usually a smaller group of wealthy citizens, but they're not necessarily the aristocracy. Uh, they're just going to be a small group of well-to-do people. Democracy, all citizens without respect to birth or wealth participate in the administration of the polis. When we think of Greek times, we usually think of democracy, but funnily enough, um, democracy was actually the least common. Then you have tyranny. Today, if you think of a tyrant or a tyranny, uh, you think of something bad. Uh, the country of Myanmar right now um, is having a military take over their government and they're being called tyrants at this time. Um, if you think of a tyrant, you might think of Hitler or Stalin or something like that. Well, in ancient Greece, that's not what a tyrant meant. In ancient Greece, a tyrant was just somebody who seized power unlawfully. And they usually use their wealth to gain some sort of political following. And then that political following can, um, you know, remove the existing government. How did each polis fight? Well, that's with the hoplite phalanx. A hoplite was the name of the farmer uh, soldier. Uh, this farmer soldier has to provide their own equipment. Uh, their equipment usually weighs about 55 pounds or so, which is very, very equivalent to today. Uh, but they're going to have armor. It's going to be a helmet, a breastplate, shin guards, and a little wooden uh, shield. They're going to have a, a <clears throat> about a th two to three foot long short sword. And then they're going to have a nine foot long spear. And that nine foot long spear is going to be their primary weapon. And the top picture here, you can see what a phalanx would look like. Uh, they're usually you know, 10 to 20 men deep. They can be a thousand men long. And the first couple of rows would have their, their spear down in, a, in 
pointed straight at the enemy. The next couple of rows would have it pointed at like a 45 degree angle. And then further back, they're pointed up in the air. And it's basically like a moving wall between the shields and the spiky bits coming out of the shields. Uh, you don't want to get close to these people. And almost every polis used this exact style of fighting. And this exact style of fighting was very effective for hundreds of years. Eventually, these polis will kind of band together to create these leagues or these federations. So these individual polis, they get allies, and these allies work together, even though the city-state itself stays independent. By the time we get to the 800s, uh, the Greek people, they've exited what's known as the Greek Dark Age. They begin to grow in wealth and numbers. Uh, lit literacy comes back and s society kind of stabilizes, if you will. And because society is kind of stabilized, um, the population starts to grow. And as the population grows, the Greeks begin to look more and more at colonizing other places. And before you know it, the Greeks are going to expand to places like modern-day Turkey, France, Italy, Spain, and even Egypt. So Greek culture is going to spread all throughout the Mediterranean Sea. And the Mediterranean Sea, in many ways, becomes kind of like a Greek lake. And in many cases, uh, Egyptian culture and Middle Eastern culture begins to mix with Greek culture until this new culture is formed, this amalgamation of these different people. Uh, this can be seen in artwork, pottery, it can be seen in agriculture, it can be seen in trade, jewelry, you name it. Um, this new culture is able to be seen. Now let's talk about Sparta. When we think of ancient Greece, there's usually, usually two places we think of Sparta and Athens. Sparta is all about warfare. Uh, Sparta begins its conquest in 735 when it takes over its neighbor, the uh, city of Messenia. Uh, it takes about 20 years to conquer the Messenians. Uh, the Messenians are turned into slaves known as helots. But eventually the helots are going to revolt against Sparta and start a rebellion. And the rebellion takes about 30 years to end. So in less than a hundred year period, Sparta has 30 plus years of warfare. And the Spartans say, uh, that's, that's too much. We need to do something. So a gentleman named Lycurgus is going to be named the leader of Sparta, and he's going to reform the entire Spartan system. He's going to make all citizens equal. Uh, there are going to be two kings. There's going to be a council of elders. Uh, domestic affairs are going to be done by a different council that's elected by the people. And all citizens are equal. Uh, think of it, if you're a Star Trek fan, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. There's no family life. The government raises the kids. Everybody works together. Everybody eats together. Everybody uh, serves together. You name it. Uh, boys are raised in a herd, if you will, called in a goge. And the whole point of having these kids live together in a heard is to take away family ties, teach them how to be warriors for Sparta. Uh, they don't get shoes. They have to eat certain things. They only get one set of clothing, you name it. And it's because their job in life is to support the state. Now, Spartan womanhood is kind of interesting. Uh, young girls do military style training just like the boys do, and that's because the young women were kept physically fit because they believed healthy women made healthy sons. Marriage is going to occur around 18 to 20. That's actually fairly late compared to most uh, Greeks. And the reason that 
Spartans married so late wasn't had nothing to do with um, women's rights or anything like that. It's actually because it was believed that women in that age range gave birth to the healthiest children. And a Spartan woman is expected to raise three boys to adulthood. That usually meant at least six kids. Marriage is by capture. Basically, a young woman is carried off, taken to a dark room, her hair is cut off, and then her husband-to-be basically rapes her. And after this rape occurs, uh, the marriage is considered complete if... A pregnancy results. The husband basically controls the woman in all matters, um, in private life, in public life, in law, you name it. Uh, the woman is controlled by the man. The woman is basically considered a um, perpetual minor or a perpetual child when it comes to legal status. Uh, Spartan culture, it's all based on warfare, as I said. Um, Food is very simple. Stories are about war. Poetry is about war. Artwork is about war. Blah, blah, blah. Athens, on the other hand, um, they're not quite as war-based. Uh, Athens is going to take some of the earliest steps towards democracy, even though it takes them a little while to get there. Uh, somewhere around 630 BC, there's an Athenian named Cylon who attempts to seize control of Athens. Uh, he wants to become a tyrant. Uh, he is not successful. Uh, his attempt to take over the government doesn't work. Cylon escapes, but most of his supporters are killed. Uh, that leads the people in Athens to ask a gentleman named Draco to rewrite the laws. And the laws that Draco writes are quite harsh. Basically, uh, the punishment for everything is death. And uh, the Draconian Code was so harsh, it was said that they were actually written in blood. Um, but even though Draco kind of evens out the law for everybody and says, okay, the punishment for everybody is death, it's still, Athens is going to have a lot of peasant unrest, and that's because of money issues. Um, in Athens back in the day, you know, all the best farmland is going to be owned by the rich. Common farmers have to struggle to survive, and they very often go in debt. And this debt, it kind of forces this economic dependence on the aristocrats. A farmer who owed a debt was forced to put up his land as collateral. And if he's not able to pay off his debt, then this farmer has to put up his family as collateral. And if that still doesn't pay up the debt, then the farmer and his family would be become slaves. And instead of becoming a slave, these farmers would often run away from Athens, which takes away tax money, it takes away food, it takes away population, you name it. Things got so bad that in the late 500s, 594 BC, a guy named Solon is asked to fix the issue. And so Solon is going to rewrite the law code again. And he's going to, first of all, say you can no longer become a slave because you owe money. And he's going to cancel debts. He's going to free slaves who are slaves because they owe debts. And he's going to ask people of Athens who ran away to come back home and say you're safe. And he's also going to rewrite the laws so that everybody had more rights. And punishments were made to equal your place in life. So if you had more money, your debt might be larger. If you had less money your debt might be smaller, things like that, or um, punishment, fine, whatever you want to call it. Now, Solon's laws were very fair. Everybody hated them equally, which is actually the sign of a good law. Uh, eventually, uh, 
around 500 BC, there's another tyrant named Cleisthenes. And in ancient Greece, tyrants aren't always bad. Cleisthenes is going to come to power. He's got widespread support of the people. And he says, hey, if you put me in power, then I'll listen to you and I'll rewrite the Constitution. And it's Cleisthenes who comes up with the first true democracy. Uh, he creates an assembly that gave political power to all citizens. Uh, and he created a council that had 500 elected members. He also gave citizenship to all 140 villages that belonged to the, to the uh, polis of Athens. So... Athenian citizenship wasn't just to those that lived within the city walls. It was to everybody who lived near Athens, which meant that all those people could vote, all those people could hold office, all those people could uh, be represented in court or participate in court in front of a jury of their peers. The other thing that Cleisthenes comes up with is this idea of ostracism. Uh, think of this like a 10 year time out. Each year, there was a vote held to see if anybody needed to be ostracized or kicked out. If a majority said yes, then a second vote was held to see who would be kicked out. And if any troublemakers were kicked out, they had to leave for 10 years. Um, however, they still got to retain their rights as a citizen. They could still keep their property. And when they came back in 10 years after, the, after their timeout was over, it was like uh, nothing ever happened. There were a lot of wars in ancient Greece. Uh, there's the Persian War, which happens in 490 BC. The Persian Empire is going to attack Athens, and that's where the famous Battle of Marathon happens. It's also the Persian War where the Battle of the 300 happens. If you've seen that movie where 300 Spartans hold off 150,000 Persians long enough for reinforcements to show up. Uh, we also have the Peloponnesian War. Uh, Athens and Sparta become the top two powers in ancient Greece. By 430 BC, they don't like each other anymore, even though they had previously been allies. And Sparta and Athens are going to go to war a couple of times. And eventually in 413 BC, Sparta defeats Athens, and Sparta is going to be the survivor, if you will. Now we also have to talk about the time of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is called the Hellenistic world. Classic Athens is called the Hellenic world. So I just want you to know that there are two different terms when we talk about ancient Greece. There's the Hellenic world, which is classic Athens, and the Hellenistic world, which is the Athens of Alexander the Great. So first, before I go on to Hellenistic Greece, let's talk real quick about Hellenic Greece. This is the classic Athens everybody thinks of. Uh, first of all, many people attribute ancient Greece to the birth of modern history. What I mean by that is the historical discipline like you're studying right now. And it basically happens because two guys, one named Herodotus and another one named Thucydides, begin to look at history just as events that happen instead of stuff affected by gods. In traditional Greek writings, you know, Zeus comes down from Mount Olympus and fights some people and Apollo helps and whatever else happens, happens. Herodotus and Thucydides are both going to say, no, Zeus wasn't involved in the fighting. It was just man versus man. Athenian architecture is going to happen during this Hellenistic period. A guy named Pericles is going to lead Athens for 20 years. And he's going to use money that he gets from some of the allies of Athens to pay for these huge construction projects. He's going to build temples. He builds the Parthenon. Uh, he builds the Temple of Athena Nike. He builds the Theater of Dionysus. Uh, when people go to Greece today and they want to see the ancient Parthenon, 
Pericles is the one who built that somewhere between 495 and 429 BC. People often think of Athenian or Greek plays. Basically, these are going to be one-act plays, and they're going to be very popular. There's going to be competitions throughout ancient Greece, and there's really not very many props. It's mostly one actor or two actors playing different parts. Uh, the plays are kind of raunchy, if you will, very adult-oriented. And there are two main categories. There's the tragedy and the comedy. And the, the um, pictures there, those are different actor masks. And the one actor would play different parts. And you could tell which part they were playing by which mask they would hold up. Greek philosophy. There are a couple different philosophers and philosophy types that you should know. First of all, you have the sophists. Uh, the sophists, they kind of ignore the physical world around them. If they can't see it, they don't believe it. Uh, and they just teach practical skills. They're very much teaching businessmen how to be good businessmen. They teach speech. They teach persuasion. They teach rhetoric. If you have had a public speaking class with... Uh, Mrs. Beverly Kirk, uh, she very much teaches persuasion and rhetoric, so you've got some experience on this. Socrates. Um, Socrates is the first of the three big philosophers. Uh, he does not take any pay for his teaching. He says, I can only teach you what I personally know. I can't teach you anything I have not experienced myself. And he uses something called the dialectic method, which is where you continually ask questions. And the reason he continually asked people questions was to make them kind of challenge their personal beliefs and look at things differently. Socrates had a student named Plato, and Plato said, you know what, wisdom is a science and you can only gain wisdom through in training, through education. And then you have Aristotle. Aristotle, basically, uh, he believes that humans are social creatures the city is the natural habitat for people. And he said, there's no way that we can have a perfect world, so we need to do the best we can. Athenian women in Hellenic Greece, they have no voting rights. They cannot take place in the assembly. They're always represented by a man in Athens, a woman would be married around the age of 13, and the primary job of a woman was to produce an heir for the man of the house. There's also a group of people called Metics. Uh, Metics were outsiders. They were non-citizens of Athens, but they were allowed to live there because they were allowed to make money. Now, even though they were not citizens, even though they could not vote, they were still required to pay taxes and they were still required to participate in military service. And then you have slaves. Uh, slaves had few, if any, rights and they could do whatever work their owner thought could make them money. Okay, Alexander the Great. As I said, this is the Hellenistic world. And first of all, when does the Hellenistic world begin? Well, it's not going to begin until after the Peloponnesian War ends. Uh, Sparta defeats Athens. The peace only lasts for a couple of years. Two of Sparta's allies, Corinth and Thebes, are going to turn their back on Sparta, and a whole new civil war begins. While this is happening, a guy from northern Greece named Philip of Macedonia is going to watch what, what's happening, and he's going to come up with, he invents these ideas on how to improve warfare. Like he's going to add horses and a cavalry. He's going to take the spears and say, let's make them 12 foot long instead of nine feet. And before you know it, Philip's going to conquer most of Greece. Uh, he can claim the Battle of Sharona in 328 BC as the time period where he is the ruler of Greece. Basically, the only part of Greece he does not conquer is Sparta, primarily because he doesn't think it's worth it. Well, what does that have to do with 
Alexander the Great. Well, Alexander the Great, or Alexander the Third, as he was known as, was the son of Philip. And he's going to inherit the throne at the age of 20 after his dad is murdered. Alexander, he's tutored and taught by Aristotle. He loves science. He's been in the military. He's served side by side with the men since the age of 18. Uh, he invades the Persian army in 334 BC. He conquers all of Asia Minor, Palestine, and Egypt by 332 BC. He conquers Assyria, which was modern-day Iraq, by 330 BC. And then by 326 BC, he's conquered Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Basically, by the age of 33, he controls a, an empire that goes all the way from Western Greece to India. And everywhere he went, Greek ideas spread. Now, he dies at the age of 33 on his way back home. He dies in the city of Babylon. Nobody really knows why. Uh, it could have been a murder. It could have been sickness. Or it could have been um, poison. We just don't know. When Alexander the Great dies, his kingdom is split up into three parts that become kingdoms in their own right. Uh, it's split between his three generals. Antigonus gets Macedonia. Seleucus gets Syria and the Western Empire, which creates the Seleucid Empire. And then a guy named Ptolemy gets Egypt, which is going to give rise to Ptolemaic Egypt, Cleopatra, and eventually um, Julius Caesar sleeping with Cleopatra. So what's different about Hellenistic life than under Hellenic life? Well, the Greece of Alexander the Great actually sees Alexandria for uh, Egypt as being the center of Greek culture. Greek culture is no longer centered in Greece itself. It has moved across the Mediterranean Sea into Egypt. Alexander the Great himself declares himself an Egyptian god, starts living an Egyptian lifestyle, and starts wearing Egyptian clothes. The city-states are no longer independent, but they're still important. They're still trading centers. These city-states are still important places in Alexander's empire. Women, instead of just being perpetual children, are given some credit. Uh, women are given some rights. Women are allowed to own some businesses, and women are given uh, literary credit and are seen as part of society instead of just children. And Greek culture spreads from Greece all the way to India. Greek ideas spread from Greece to India. Greek language spreads from Greece to India. And yes, Alexander the Great did sleep with a lot of women, and so Greek genes are spread from Greece to India. There's a separate philosophy that happens underneath Hellenistic Greece. Uh, there are the Cynics, founded by, by Diogenes of Sinope. Uh, these Cynics, they reject all the conventions of society. Uh, basically, these people... Um, they, well, Diogenes, he kind of says that happiness can be found in simplicity. All of the fancy stuff in society, the cynics are going to reject. You have the Epicureans, who was found, they were found by a guy named Epicurus. They only trusted what they could personally detect with their senses. Now that's important because they could not see the afterlife, so they didn't believe in an afterlife. These guys kind of lived like hermits. Uh, they didn't think there was a soul. They didn't think there was life after death. They actually thought that too much pleasure could cause pain, but then they wanted to avoid pain I mean, these guys are just completely unique, if you will. And then finally, you have the Stoics, which were founded by a guy named Zeno. This was almost like a religion, but not quite. Uh, Stoics, they would argue that humans lived in harmony with nature, and then they have to 
live in harmony with themselves. So they have to live in harmony with good and evil. They have to keep things in a balance. And they actually saw life as having three parts, good, evil, and indifference. Uh, examples of good would be courage, wisdom, justice, and prudence. Evil was cowardice, spendthrift, injustice, foolishness. And then indifference were things that they couldn't really control, like life, health, beauty, strength, things like that. Now, the Stoics, they actually thought passion was the root of all evil. And if you were too passionate, then you were seen as having a soul that was sick. Now, if that's not enough, there were also these mystery cults that were going rampant in Greece. Basically, if you had a belief, there was a cult for you. There were cults to... Demeter, there were cults to Dionysus, there were cults to Osiris and Hades and Isis. Um, there were just very, very, very many beliefs going on and very, very many different philosophies going on other than the Cynics, Epicureans, and Stoics. All right, so what is next for us? Let me pull this up here. We are on Lesson 7, Ancient Greece, and I apologize again that this is pretty long. For this week, there's a lot of work, and I'm sorry. It's just the way that the Greek week falls. Uh, you have one discussion, Discussion 7. You have to answer a couple of questions. There are three quizzes. There's Quiz 8, Quiz 9, and Quiz 10. So don't wait till the last minute to do these three quizzes. And there's also a reflection paper. Um, you can use any of the readings for India, China, or Ancient Greece. And remember, about a page and a half, double-spaced, one paragraph, just quickly summarizing whichever thing you're going to write on, and then the next, you know, fill up that page and a half with your thoughts, ideas, opinions of it. So maybe the reading on Buddhism really struck a chord with you and you want to talk about that, you can do so. Or maybe the readings for this week, you're like, wow, that's really cool. Or, man, I really hated this reading. That's okay, too. Just make sure that you you give me an opinion on something and you explain why you feel the way you do. Uh, next week, we're not going to be meeting because us instructors, us teachers, professors, whatever you want to call us, will be having a teacher work day, if you will. So... Our next meeting is going to be on the 9th, and that's going to be an in-person meeting. So we'll actually get to see each other face-to-face, -face, and I really apologize that it's going to be a test, but that's just kind of how this is fall. Uh, next week, there won't be a lecture video, but I will try to put something out that's a little bit of a study guide for you. I do encourage you to go back and look at these videos and watch these videos and look at the the PowerPoints I made, because that is where most of the material for the test will come from. All right, I think I've kept enough of your attention. I, I'm sure you're not listening anymore, so uh, let me end it here. If you have any questions or anything, please email me. Uh, don't forget to get your work done, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.